Grand Rising Soul Family. Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons podcast. Brothers and sisters, the stories that we tell ourselves matter. And the stories are here, but are we? Have we lost the capacity to behold them? That is a quote from our guest today. Dr. Martin Shaw is joining us. I'm so excited to drop in with Martin on the stories, the stories that we're currently telling ourselves and our children and how storytelling can inform us and of what's to come for our future. So with that, our guest today, he's a poet, storyteller, and mythologist. He's a wilderness rites of passage guide, and he is the author of Courting the Wild Twin. Please welcome Dr. Martin Shaw. Pleased to be here, Adam. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, thank you for being here. And so there's this allegation in the world that we need a new story. And from what I've read of your work, I was just reading some of your, your papers, is that the stories are here, but are we actually listening? Are we hearing them? Yes, I mean, I think it's an amazing question. We need a new story, because uh, then that we would follow that immediately with what kind of story? I uh, know many people trapped in narratives, they would be best off to abandon, you know? <laughs> True. Uh, and and I, think, I think when it comes to stories that offer true mythic nutrition, they're stories that almost speak across species, that they haven't mm. just been cranked out by someone over a laptop with a deadline. They're actually, they come from someone going walkabout someone going out into the bush for a few days and at a certain point a raven or a mountain or a stretch of river started to talk to them <sighs> and over time this kind of hedgerow gossip begins and you begin to hear little seal holes like when you go fishing for seal there are little seal holes in the story that have more than a human perspective to them so i suppose I do understand why people would say we need a new story, especially in the kind of narcissan hypnosis of our times when the narratives we generally get fed or our children get fed are the Instagram variety. And we just feel neurotic because we don't seem to be living our best life. But actually my caution or my invitation actually would just be that especially from indigenous cultures, but also in Greek and Russian and Irish stories, there is a kind of invitation to a much wider relational cosmological relationship to the earth that hinges really on us falling back in love with the earth again. Mm. And once our hearts get involved, not just our neurosis or our statistics when we think about climate change, people really figure out what they love and what they want to defend. Uh, and, you know, that those are the kind of stories we need. Now, although I'm an advocate, particularly for stories from a long time ago, mm -hmm. because they have a kind of actually a kind of an eternal currency, I'm yeah. not for a second, I'm not implying there's nothing new under the sun. I'm not implying that there aren't mythic stories that as naturally as anything will continue to evolve. I'm not trying to, uh, to kind of crush people's imagination. I'm just trying to point towards the root system. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. There is this, there's a sense like we're in the new paradigm, everything's new again. And there's a reality that, mm. that the cycles um, that have permeated throughout time and history have been felt by human beings who are had the same bodies as us. They had the same limbs, they had the same minds as us, maybe different technology, but the emotions are the same. And so you, you really, you really talk about how a story that has the deep oral tradition that's been told from mouth to ear over and over, those are the ones that we can really, um, that, that withstand the test of time. Yeah. Today, I've been thinking a lot about the difference between charisma and character. And I've been thinking that social media is very good at, at giving us charisma. People can dazzle 
without you really having a sense of quite who they are or where they come from. Absolutely. But character, you, which usually is hewn in disaster and fatigue and making lots of wrong decisions, <laughs> character comes over time and it can't really be sped up. And I yeah. think that's one of the things you're getting at is the myths, they have character. They don't just tell us about the conditions of life they tell us how to live it. That's the big thing. They don't just tell us about the weather patterns. These are stories filled with wit and ingenuity and suffering and occasional triumph. Yeah. And the big thing that hangs over all of them, really, is in the end, whatever journey the characters are on, especially from a human kind of dimension, ultimately they're of service to something bigger than their own ambition. So folks start out fairly self-obsessed and then through entry to the mysteries and the kingdom of suffering and everything that comes with it often end up finally being of service. Uh, and that is something actually that we kind of need to, we need to be rebooted on that every day because it's very easy to forget. It's, it's one thing we as humans are great at is forgetting. Mm. And so this journey of life is a remembrance. And, um, you know, just as you're speaking, I was thinking of the, the hero's journey and uh, the work of Robert Bly and how, how, the, how this type of storytelling, uh, which really uh, is infused across all stories, um, is so meaningful for men. And how men, how men really, really uh, connect to this idea of a hero's journey. They do. They do. Now, I think, I think my only kind of caveat, and I would imagine you agree with me, is that there's all sorts of journeys that humans go on. Uh, and, you know, at the moment, there are very good books coming out on what they call the heroine's journey in all sorts mm. of different perspectives. Yeah. But I think if just for a second, we're thinking about how a lot of guys are instinctively wired, excuse me, there's a cat right over here, so I'm stroking a cat at the same time. <laughs> uh, male cat called Harry there is actually an unavoidable, unequivocal narrative uh, to men's lives, which is usually hinged on vocation. It's, it's, a, mm. it's about vocation. We're willing to put up with all kinds of crap, providing there's something up ahead, usually actually that is more than money. It's more yeah. than uh, uh, just you know material things. If there's a deeper connection, then that is something that will sustain us through almost any peril. Now, you mentioned Robert Bly. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with Bly a lot in yes. the last um, 15 years or so. I ended up leading a conference called the Great Mother Conference, which was up in Maine, mm. the oldest mythopoetic conference in America. Uh, and for just under a decade, I was able to help serve the tradition that he he had started in part inspired by Joseph Campbell and Jung and Marie Louise von France and all of those people. And everyone came through that conference. There was Martin yes. Grechtel, there was Stephen Jenkinson, there was Maladoma Samay for years, uh, Tom Robbins, the guy who wrote Jitterbug Perfume, it, it, phenomenal. Uh, David Abrams, Paul Kingsnorth, Charles Eisenstein, the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, but the thing that I, you know, modesty aside for a minute, the thing that I really did reintroduce to that conference was front and center all the way through one big story. Mm. Now, it's, it's, it's great to have stories you can put in your pocket. It's great to have stories you can tell around a campfire. But a story that is going to last several days has an entirely different effect on people even if they only have it for one or two hours a day, you tell the Odyssey, or you tell Gilgamesh, or you tell uh, the Epic of Parsifal, that is a time for 90 or 200 people or 10 people to sink profoundly into the, the ship of the stories, to set sail with it. Mm -hmm. So um, I recognized many years ago in my life the only way I could talk well about profound personal experience was through stories. 
I didn't want it to come out in a kind of pop psychology fashion. I didn't want to be so abstract. I sounded like a philosopher. I wanted, I wanted to move from I statements to once upon a time statements. Because when you do that, <laughs> you, you, you put your arms around everybody. Everyone's in. There's very yeah. few people in the world who say, if there's one thing I just cannot stand, it's a great story. <laughs> so, right. so that's and that's my counsel to anybody watching this if you are currently uh selling yourself as a sort of somatic ayahuascan wizard you <laughs> might want to just kind of park that slightly keep it on the low down just call yourself a storyteller because what will happen is you will gain entry to all sorts of places you never would have expected to do your work in because most people really do understand that the most terrible thing that can happen to you is feel that you've fallen out of your own story. That's the most mm. existential place. And so storytelling, a word that sounds so benign and sort of sweet and old ladies in libraries reading you books, actually is, is a kind of cloak for all kinds of phenomenal interior work that can absolutely yes. change people's lives. I love this image of an old woman reading me a story in a library. Mm. It feels like in that moment, anything is possible. Yeah. You know, the, the, the possibilities are, are endless in that space. And it, it reminds me of the season, the season of, of autumn and leaves fallings and, and warm soups. Yeah, this is the time. I mean, this is absolutely the time to settle by the fire and whether you have just got a little book of grim stories in front of you uh, or you've recite you've got a story living on the antler tip of your tongue uh get to telling it people love it and not just children the notion the mm. notion of storytelling is primarily for kids is very new it's only a few hundred years old it's really uh that's kind of comes out of a literary tradition we all knew that you know, 200 years ago, where I'm talking to you now on a place called Dartmoor, 365 square miles of wilderness, when someone rolled in with a new fairy tale, that was something that kept everybody warm for the winter. And what would happen is everyone would hear the wandering storyteller, they'd all get it, then the storyteller would leave, and a week later someone would say, Oh, come on, on Friday, come around and tell us that story again. And someone would tell it and someone would say, well, I remember a slightly different detail. Yeah, yeah. And hence the oral tradition exists. Uh, and that never gets old. It just never gets old. Telling a story, I worry a bit at the moment because I see, I see people with great knowledge of the symbology of stories and very clever things to say about stories. But I worry sometimes they're not, actually telling the stories yeah, they're they're speaking they're, in the, the i statements yeah they're immediately into exegesis they right. are immediately making the story work for the conditions of modernity which is the wrong way around modernity should be working for the old stories you know yes that's that's a powerful statement i just want to sit with that modernity should be uh, what's the what's the cat's name again Called Harry, and he's been there through every single <laughs> book I've ever written. He's very just, old. Just for a visual for those who are listening, Martin is 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 stroking a, a a cat named Harry as we're having this beautiful conversation. Yeah, modernity should be listening to the old stories. That's it. As soon as you are trying to cut and paste myths to make allegorical points about <laughs> anything, then you've lost it. Yeah, you've lost it. You're dealing with a pelt, not a wild animal anymore. The story is no longer alive. So, um, yeah. yeah it, 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 but to be honest, if you don't know that, if you just say you're, you know, you just you go, well, I, I really have a connection to story. I don't blame younger folks particularly for thinking, but they they are exercising the wrong part of their imagination. I swear to you, the yeah. thing you have to do is don't tell the story what it is. Just pay fidelity to it. Just keep yes. turning up and telling it. And over time, like going to sit by a waterfall or stalking a bear or something, 
you you get to know a, what they call a phenomenological relationship to it where you're not looking at it and saying well what this is all really about is the crisis in ukraine and something to do with my mother you know it's just a big fucking black bear you know yeah. and just let it be a bear yeah. uh, james hillman the psychologist used to say and he was a great fan of dreams but he said as soon as you tell as soon as you wake up and say the snake in the dream was my mother there's no snake left mm. and you've really got to allow the snakiness of the dream to unfold and that's really the core of proper you know magical property high voltage storytelling it's the same with music it's the same with rock and roll it's the same with hip-hop when we allow the lyrics the message the the frequency to be felt and not explained mm. and particularly from the artists themselves yes. um, it allows that song or that story to have meaning for me mm. and for everyone who, and for everyone in that room I, I love i love where you're going and so let's go into the wild because because the other piece around storytelling is place and setting and and i and i know that you're one who's deeply connected uh, to the wilderness and so how does how does the land how does the great mother uh, inform us when we're, when we're speaking her stories? Very good question, really. Uh, I think uh, most of what I do is either kind of land related or story related and primarily a weave between the two. Now we're talking today and you're in San Diego. That's right. Well, I, I work every few years, I work up the coast uh, at Stanford. Uh, where I've been a, a sort of visiting professor on and off for about 10 years, teach under a, an oak tree. We're very mm. sweet to find a place out in the bush. Um, but one of the things, obviously, you encounter in America is people with extraordinary and often very inspiring migrational stories. So in other words, no one at Stanford is from Palo Alto, nobody. <laughs> but, but, they, but you only have to go a generation back and stories on an epic scale deserving of the Iliad turn out when you find what their parents or grandparents went through to get them to this fabled land called uh, Turtle Island or Turtle called America. Right. So as we're going into this question, there's sort of two different elements to it. And what I notice at the moment, and I salute it, it's a healthy thing, is that just in the same way people these days often pay attention to where their food comes from, what they're eating, what they're ingesting, well, stories are the same. And so one of the things I did about 10 years ago was I effectively drew a kind of chalk circle of about 10 miles around where I lived. And I said, you know, for the next half decade, no more Gilgamesh, no more nothing other than the stories that are right here tucked underneath my feet. Otherwise, I'm in danger of being a kind of ventriloquist dummy. You know, I'm not really speaking from, from anything particularly deep. And it's a question I always say to people, are you willing to trade a little growth for depth? You know, we live in a growth fixated culture, but we end up knowing we're, you know, nine miles wide, but two inches deep. So the first advocacy is really for getting to know the place you're in and a place that you love and are captivated by. Then, and this, of course, in America is a, is a different kind of issue to something I experience in England. People say, well, uh, I feel awkward about being in America in the first place. I feel you know, very aware of the issue. You know, the, this is First Nations place. Maybe we should yeah. all leave. That's a conversation uh, that I think is very, very valid. But I think that there is a difference between being what I'm saying to you now in a very short form could be unpacked for weeks. Of but course. What we we're talking, I often talk about the difference between being from a place and of a place. So I can say with a degree of certainty that my family or, or strands of my family have lived where I live for several hundred years. It just goes back. No one's moved there from here. However, how profoundly connected they all are to where I live is another matter. 
they are skating they're sort of ingesting the same helium that we all are we're all in the same shopping mall now right that we're all kind of in the same shopping mall unless you make a real protracted effort to say no actually i'm going to become familiar with the animals that are abiding here but with the plant systems with the mushrooms with the way the wind moves with particular spots the old irish bards had something called brooding spots where you would find a place and you would diligently show up in it sit in it and stay and stay and stay and the way the seasons moved began organically to tell you about the shape of your own life it's you know it's the root of the wilderness vigil it's the root of all of that yeah. so on the one hand relationship to place can be very profound and the kind of stories that are gold dust for a a storyteller are ones that have an address in that have a zip code and what i mean by that is stories that say it was that mountain it was this bend in the river it was those people so suddenly you've got a story that doesn't travel nomadically but is rooted like a particular kind of plant in a place that's fantastic it's a wonderful yes. thing but I do feel that what gets forgotten sometimes is that we also have many myths and cultures that are nomadic in temperament and are kind of designed mm. to travel. Uh, and you find sometimes stories, believe it or not, there's a story, there's a book about it by someone called Taggart. It's called The Bear and His Sons. That's all I can tell you. But he did a study where he said, why is it that we have the same magical bear stories in Russia that we do in Mexico? I mean, that's a mm. very, very different culture. That's not diffusion. That's not just, well, Mexico, of course, is full of Russians. It's not. How <laughs> does that happen? Now, Campbell, Campbell coming out of Jung would say that that's the collective unconscious. That's right. That there is some sort of dream weaving going on and we know that we were once wedded to the wild and we know that we have strange nocturnal relationships to animal presences and they slip out of our body when we fall asleep all of that yeah. so what i'm what i'm presenting to you with this with this inquiry is on the one hand pay attention to the slow ground stories of where you find you've washed up on you can't beat yourself up continually about the fact that actually your your family may come from some other place you can always go back if you can but secondly do be aware that some stories are bound to travel some mm. stories are just going to turn up with these kind of universal pressure points in them and actually i found you know 20 20 years ago i lived in a tent no computer, no phone, no nothing. It didn't even have the cat yet. And I found that the way my vocabulary as a storyteller organically built was as a combination of stories that I felt connected to from wider traditions like the Arthurian or the Irish. Um, so bigger stories but then these very indigenous little narratives connected to the valley i lived in or the moorland i was on and that's what you want to look for you yes. want to look for some stories that pop with universal themes because that's what will gal galvanize a whole group of people but as part of your discipline you also need to have a really devotional relationship to place thank you for that you know in your essay from is overrated. You say, mm -hmm. if you don't have the bones of the loved ones in the ground of that land, then you have no Aboriginal claim. I love that. I love that, that quote. And I wanted to say, I'm, I'm here in San Diego, California. This is Kumie territory mm. and sacred sons has been fortunate to invite Kumie elders and bird singers to some of our events. And they, they have these stories of these mountains and these rocks and these lands and their creation story is 10,000 years old. And it takes four days to tell it. It takes four days to tell their creation story. Um, and I, I don't mean the story itself is 10,000 years. The people have been on this land for 10,000 years and the story may be 
maybe even older. So no, but, it, it, but, I, but I love this, this idea, like for me, and I'm someone who traveled here and in this generation, in this lifetime, mm-hmm. that I can access the story of this place as I am creating uh, the story of my own voyage, the story of my journey. Yes. So he, here's an example of that. I just mentioned the Arthurian tradition. So we know that that's King Arthur and all of these characters like Lancelot and there's a lady in the lake and all of that. And in your imagination, I'm sure you associate that with with England and Britain and and the round table. The Knights Templar. Yeah, but there's actually major scholarship to suggest an enormous amount of those original images come from a place called the Caucasus. Now the Caucasus really now has been sort of assimilated into Russia. And it's between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea. There's a book about it called From Scythia to Camelot. And one of the things I argue in a book of mine called Scatterlings, which was the book actually about living in a very small area, I said, all right, who who now owns these stories? Uh, And, you know, is it, should they be sort of ritually given back to the Caucasus? But they also have, the Arthurian stories have Islamic tradition within them. And that comes up from Moorish Spain. The Mm. Arthurian romances have as much to do, ironically, with Islam as they do with, uh, you know, Welsh tales. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second, for a fraction of a second, that that the First Nations situation with an ancient story is the same, and people come in and say, well, it belongs to everybody now. That's not what I mean. What what I am saying, what I am saying is for wherever we live, real mythology doesn't stop. Real myth-making doesn't stop. It's, it can't stop. It's as, it's as likely to happen as it is you breathing or drinking water. It's just going to continue. It is and, like water. It's going to take the form yeah, of the next yeah. container that it inhabits. It is. And you know how water gets through any crack. Yes. It'll get through any crack, through any vessel it possibly can. Well, that's what myth in these stories are like. They're not going anywhere, uh, but they will ironically continue to evolve. Here's an example. I have just finished uh, a weekend, uh, a couple of, you know, like yesterday, where I had 70 students from all over the world came to study with me. And before I started to tell the main stories, I always ask people, once they've arrived, did you dream? Mm. And that's a very interesting conversation for 70 people. And what happened, and what happens fairly frequently, is not only do people dream, they dream the same thing. Wow. And they start to dream things as a preemptive, a preemptive imaginative strike of what I'm about to tell them in the story, but they don't know. Because I never announce ahead of time. Generally, I don't announce what I'm going to tell. So we have three women all dreaming the same dream. Now, in a traditional culture, that is how a mythology stays fresh and moves along. The storyteller tells the particular story they tell at this time of year. Everyone enjoys it as they always do. But then over the next few weeks, various members of the tribe start to dream the next chapter of the mythology. But it's worth paying attention to the fact that it comes from dream time. It doesn't come from trying to make a story that is more politically correct or kind of in tune with the moment. You, you, you can't do that to these wild old things. They're too, it's a, the, the field of meaning is too immense, it's too powerful. But when something really does need to shift, when some kind of new health or energy arises, in other words, we're back to what you said at the beginning, Adam, the notion of a new story it will happen organically because people profoundly connected to that story will collectively start to dream the next bit. (laughs) I love that. I love, I love that the mythology can come from a collective dream. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about it, mythology is nothing more. uh, And I don't mean that in a dismissive way. It's, it's, It's lots of dreams that have stood the test of sort of consciousness 
and are melded together and become a cultural story. And we dream our own crazy little mythologies every night. There's nothing we can... That's why I, I, like, I, like dream. I like dreams because we cannot corral them. Most of us, yes. anyway, I can't corral mine. I'm, I'm, a, I'm at the mercy of a dream. Uh, and I think for any of us that are interested in things that are not too domesticated, that keep us connected to the wild, uh, dreaming is the, is the bedrock of that. I've been, uh, I was, I've just come back from San Francisco. I was, I was there last week and it's very sad actually. I, I got over there and immediately got sick. I got mm. COVID and I spent the whole time being ill in the kind of, it's interesting in, 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 in Celtic myth, when you travel west from Ireland or Britain, you go to die or to heal. Yeah. Now that's America, that's America. Yes. And so as I got iller and as I lay in my bed, every time I closed my eyes, I was on the boat, you know, swilling this way and that way, filled with sickness, um, wondering about my relationship to this land of the far west, this legendary place. But um, yeah, you see, because I've got COVID, because I'm recovering from COVID, I can't quite remember the thread <laughs> of why there, I'm telling you this. Was there a, let me ask you a question. Was there a part of your experience with COVID where it kind of took the spirit from you? Where did, does anything matter? Why am I actually here? Why am I in San Francisco right now? I'm, does, did it, was it a, was it soul crushing in, at all for you? No, no, it wasn't soul crushing. I think, I, you know, I know what that feels like for sure. I mean, I'm 51, I've, I've had those moments. Uh, no, it was, I mean, I had an interesting thing because there was a story, an old story, Gawain and the Green Knight, that as soon as I got sick, for some reason, every time I closed my eyes, I was in that story. So I had, I was dragged into Gawain and the Green Knight. And then when I came back to England a few days ago, I then told it to this group of people because it had been brewed down in the deep interior. But I didn't go through that. I was aware, and I'm sure many people relate to this. It's funny because the symptoms were rather like flu initially, or they were rather like a, a really bad cold, but there was also something else going on that my body knew it had never experienced before. There was some something yes. was something was loose. There's I've a there's a foreigner with, in, in, yeah, in, at, at play. You know, and I've come I've come out with sort of skin knit itches and strange little muscle twitches and all sorts oh, of sure. things. But I didn't go through depression. Actually, the the overview that it gave me was a phenomenal sense of gratitude for my own mm. life and what I get to do and how much I love being a father. They were the conditions that I was left with as I wobbled back to England a few days ago. How old are your kids? I got one daughter and she's 17. Uh, so she's a, a really interesting age where over here, within a year, that would be the time that she would go off to possibly to university or something like right. that. And, you know, we've just been talking on the phone today about, you know, English and classics and drama and all the things that she loves. And the, the emotional intelligence of that young woman is astonishing to me. She's like a, a little 30 year old scurrying around. Mm. So I love that. And I've got, I think 10 nieces and nephews. So there's a yeah. lot of boys, a lot of girls, a lot of wild energy. And, and my daughter knows all the stories. She can tell all the stories that I can tell. Wow. So, she so she's, was she hearing them as a young child? Yeah. Wow, that's she incredible. Was, when she was five, when she was five, she did some kind of hybrid version of this story, Passable, which is book length. It's book length in terms of length and Tatterhood and the Lindworm and Firebirds and Irish stories. Now, as all kids, there comes a point briefly when she then becomes very self-conscious and embarrassed about that and doesn't want to talk about it. But now, as she goes to university or goes to college and studies classics, and they said, we're going to introduce something called the Odyssey. The Odyssey. <laughs> She's like, Yes, I will tell you that tale. It was right, the secret right. Troy, uh, and and we're off. 
So very slowly, increment, and I hope all parents listening to this do take courage because there'll be periods where the relationship you have with your children may feel a bit blank, like there's not going on. Your feet, nothing's nothing's being received. But years later, they'll tell you, mm. I remember that walk you took of me on. I remember that creek. I remember the fact that you prayed by my bed night after night. I remember that. We have a lot of fathers listening to this right now. Oh, wonderful. Yes. So one, I want to I want to ask you about your own journey of fatherhood, but how would you uh, inspire the fathers listening to really take up the art of storytelling uh, it, from your own experience and how it's impacted the, the relationship between you and your daughter? Well, I think the first thing I'd, I'd probably acknowledge is there would definitely be guys listening to us who are probably in far from perfect circumstance. They may not be living with the mum. They may not be living with the, They may not see that much of their child or their children. Yeah. Uh, so, for, and I've been through that myself. Yes. You know, I'm a, I, I've had to sort of rebuild my nest as best I can. And so they all have my love and solidarity and understanding of that from the beginning. But you, you and I know there is no greater charge in this world, uh, a charge when in a, in a, if you were a knight of the round table, they would say, I charge you with loving and raising your child. I charge mm. you with it. And your legs should totter under the vocation of that. It's not a casual thing. And so the thing that you can do starting tonight, starting today, starting this minute, the door of mercy is still open, it's not too late, is to start telling your kids stories straight from your, straight from you. Take them for a walk, especially guys. And Bly used to talk about this. Men don't always communicate gazing deeply into their son's eyes, but they go for a walk with them by the lake or, they, or through a town or to a park. And as they're going, you just begin to tell them some very simple little fairy tale, maybe two or three pages in a book, super simple. And your child will probably say nothing or they'll say, Dad, can I have my phone now or something like that? Or where's my screen? And you just don't give it to them right away. And then you walk and you sit down next to the river and they're quiet. And then 10 minutes later, they say, so what was the name of that guy? Rumpelstiltskin? And you say, yeah, Rumpelstiltskin. What's his, how do we guess his name? And you just persistently tell them stories, especially when it's time to go to bed, especially when that, yeah. that liminal moment. Um, and just, just cherish it and know that, as, as I think we all understand, but it's hard not to get hypnotized by the world. There is, there's no business deal you're gonna land there's no record contract you're going to get. There's no woman you're going to sleep with. None of it is ever going to pilot. It's going to pilot to a hill. It's a hill of nothing, in comparison to the relationship you have with your child. Mm. Uh, and so you, if you, if you're lucky enough to have children, you already won the lottery. You're already the luckiest guy on the block. Uh, and so you know, bless you onwards. Take courage. Keep going. Thank you. Thank you for those words of encouragement. I have, I have three boys, uh, wow. eight, almost three and one. And this is the greatest service I could, I could give to society is to, yeah. is to raise them, is to be yeah. present in their lives, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I, I, I think in terms of men who are looking for solutions and tools and lo log logistical pieces to help them in parenting, mm. lean into the, the, to, into the art of storytelling. I, I just, I love this invitation from you. So thank you. Yeah. Here's another really weird, this is a very particular point, is if you, if you start to tell those strange stories, you, you, not all stories are designed to be told by you. One or two particular tales will attract you. Just, and, and, and then the next obvious question is, well, where do I find these stories? If you want, you can just go on YouTube and put my name in. You're going to find thousands <laughs> of them. Read my books or anyone else's that's dealing with myth and story. But ideally, find a story, uh, could be a story I used to tell called Ivan the Bear's Son. 
that's a great story for young men about a hunter that finds a boy in the it, woods. It would it would be it would behoove us all if I just ask you to tell us a story. So, you know, at this at this time, I think we're ready. We're ready for one. So, okay, here's, tap here's, into what? Yeah, tap yeah, into what feels. Here's that true. story. So long time ago, there was a settlement next to a forest, and the terrible thing was that no one went into the forest anymore. They were frightened of it. But there was one guy, it's just an old hunter. And one day he went out and he came across all these little cubs and he knew bear cubs. And he knew that was a dangerous thing because mama bear was going to be around. But he saw amongst them, there was this little curly haired, green eyed boy. And he scoops him up, puts him under his coat, takes him back to his wife. Now his wife longed for many things, but the thing that she really longed for was a child. So can you imagine when he opens the sack up, it's not, uh, it's not uh, you know, venison in there, it's a little baby. Now the boy grows and they say he grew not by years, not by months, not by weeks, not by days, but by hours. And suddenly they've got this kind of adolescent boy. And the trouble is when you have a boy who you found in the wild, and I've worked with many young lads like this, when they kind of wrestle the domestic kids of the village, they're a little rough and they, they are possibly what you could describe as feral, not wild. And after a while, this lad is now adolescent and the villagers say to him, you really, or they say to the dad, actually, they say, we can't have a kid with this kind of energy around. He's going to burn the village down. So the father with a heavy heart or the foster dad says, look, man, I'm going to have to send you out into the world. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a club. Now, a club like a big stick. He says, this is my club. And this club has all my wit, all my skill, all my intelligence and all my, my wisdom in it. And the young lad, whose name is Ivan, the bear's son, for obvious reasons, he grabs his dad's stick and he says the kind of preposterous thing that all young men say. He says this. He said, I'm Ivan the bear's son, and I fear nothing, not even a witch. Now, when I'm telling this live, everyone at that moment goes, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. You know, he set up his date with Baba Yaga. The young man strides out from the village, and for many years, he lives with three giants. You know, it's the equivalent, he's joined a little Hell's Angel chapter. You know, they go around and they, they bash things, and they live alone in a... They live out in the forest around a fire that never goes out. But they start to get plagued, it's too long to go into here, by Baba Yaga, who's the great northern witch. Baba Yaga is this strange underworld being who rides around this world on a mortar and pestle. And she is ferocious, strange. She's like a streak of lightning. They say at night she goes around collecting, she goes around to little children while they sleep and she removes their teeth and replaces them with little bits of iron. She's very creepy, but she lives down in the other world. And after this altercation, Ivan realizes he has to go down there to take her on on her own terms or she'll come back. So he asks his three brothers to keep watch at the top of the tunnel that leads down into the underworld and to help him up the rope when he returns. Down he goes. He has a huge fight with Baba Yaga, and due to various spiritual advice he gets, he wins. But here's the interesting thing. Underneath the hut, which something people don't talk about, is there's a beautiful garden underneath Baba Yaga's hut, a garden of wild flowers, and a maiden that lives there, and she tends the flowers. Some say she is another aspect of Baba Yaga. Well, when the terrible element of Yaga has been defeated, the maiden, in all her ordinary beauty, says, I'll come with you to your land of white. I'll come with you to the above world. Let's see what happens. He takes her to where his brothers are waiting. He lifts her up on the rope and the brothers go, ah, Ivan's come back. And they're pulling up the rope and they're pulling up the rope and they're pulling up the rope. But what do they see coming out of the ground is not, uh, you know, Ivan, it's a beautiful, beautiful woman. And so they go into a huddle and they decide to do something terrible. 
poor old Ivan is climbing up the rope behind her in a state of ecstatic bliss, thinking I've this woman, I could have a life with her. I've defeated Baba Yaga. Now I'm going to be with my faithful brothers. Why does the rope feel weird? Well, I'm afraid <laughs> they saw through the rope. <whistles> bang. And they betray their brother. Ivan breaks every body, uh, every bone in his body. He's back down in the other world. The three brothers make off with the maiden of the flowers. And Ivan is left in the most terrible of states. But over time, he, he's so still for so long, moss grows over his body. He's almost like a kind of green man. But when he'd been searching for Baba Yaga, he'd been feeding a little bird for no reason other than his own goodness. Little bird, he'd leave out some breadcrumbs. Well, the bird came back and realized that this great lump of moss was the man that had been feeding her. And so she begins to bring him what the storytellers call dark meat. And bit by bit, although he will always have a limp for the rest of his life, he starts to recover. And when he can stand, that little bird, that little ally becomes a much bigger bird. He gets on the back. He moves down from the deep interior up into our world. And he kind of crawls off and he says, well, I'm going to have a limp for the rest of my life. And the bird says, you know, some limps are really worth having. You know, that scar is going to matter a lot more to you than all your little pretty victories up till now. That scar is worth more. And so he searches through the seasons, through the autumn and the winter. And in the spring, finally, he comes to the hut that his brothers live in. And he finds the maiden of the flowers outside tending the cows. And he says, why on earth are you tending the cows? And she says, you know what? None of them. I decided I, wouldn't worry. I, I wasn't prepared to marry any of the three. So they've been arguing ever since about who will marry me. They can't agree. And really, they don't know what to do with me. So Ivan says, OK, one moment. I've got to attend to the brothers. So he goes in, keeps his hat down in disguise, uses his father's club for explosively effective reasons. The three brothers, the three giants, Scarpa. And finally, he changed now, deepened as a man, is able to marry that other part of Baba. He marries the dark of the maiden of the flowers and a wonderful wedding takes place back at the village from where we started the story. Now he can be a true elder of that village. And the first thing he, he does is he leaves meat out at the edge of the village. So the bear comes from the beginning, who is his original mother and all the little cubs. And he goes out, talks to them, catches up on village gossip, and then comes back. And he and the maiden of the flowers, as far as I know, abide in that village happily to this day. Mm. There's a story. <laughs> and that that's a story. I mean, I've just told it to you in five minutes, but that's a story. That's a five hour tale for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, that's how long it took at the, the weekend. Wow. I love that. He literally had to be immersed buried deep in the earth. That's it. Very deep in the earth before he could return. That's it. You see, it's, you know, we are fixated with, as men, I think, often with rather heroic narratives. And there's this disparity between the life we're actually living with all its letdowns and scuffs and yeah. what modernity tells us we should be achieving. But a story like that tells us that one trip into the underworld is going to teach us more than everything before that moment. And we begin to become acquainted with submission and we begin to understand sometimes the holiness of failure. Uh, it's what I learned from Bly. It's, it's really what I learned from Bly is that you, and you will know this in men's work, you never, ever bring a room of men together deeply by sharing victory stories, right. ever. It's Correct. always, okay. It's you always know. the depth of heartbreak. Yeah, bingo, bingo. 
you know, Bly used to, I only saw him do this once because actually the results were so devastating. He said to me, I'm, I'm not going to do that again. Um, he once said, I want everyone in the room to tell me something they've never told anyone before. And uh, they did. And uh, it went on, you know, and there was probably well over 150 men there. So we suddenly realized, oh, God, my God, we're into a nine hour thing. And it's the first <laughs> night. It's the first night uh, until somebody told some, somebody, you know, took him at his word, told him a story that was so horrifying. Uh, but I said, I don't want to hear any more stories. I want this to stop. Uh, so the evening kind of crashed around us. And from then on, the, the guys continued, but in, in small groups. There's a genius to small groups because things can be disclosed there that, that aren't as kind of display heavy yes. uh, as, as the bigger things. And in fact, a lot of times we're inviting, in the work that we are doing, we're inviting men out of their story and into the feeling, into the emotion, into the somatic experience. Gotcha. Um, because that's what needs to move. That's the energy that wants to be expressed. So in, and in this case, specifically with men, sometimes the attachment to the story is what's in the way. Of course. Yeah. 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 You know, um, and it behooves us also to, to create that new story, that new vision. I was recently uh, with Charles Eisenstein and, and he also encouraged the fathers as a part of his talk to not only tell stories at night, but to tell them with enthusiasm, even when we're tired, even when it's been a long day, even if it's, you've, you haven't seen them in two weeks, but to bring the enthusiasm because they will feel it. Yeah, uh, and here, here's a quote that sums that up. This is Rumi. If you mm -hmm. haven't been fed, become bread. If you haven't been fed, become bread. Because many of the men listening to this will think, I never had who, you know, who told me those stories? Well, guess what? No one fucking did. And you can either stay there and, and just feel bad about that. Or you can, you can do the most radical act of healing that I know, which is start to start to pass on the energy that you didn't receive. And then by doing that, you find, good Lord, I myself am receiving the benefit, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that, that's the thing is don't get hung up about the fact that you didn't uh, go out and fast on a hill for 10 days when you were nine years old and you, you know, your name is uh, not Sweetgrass Man. Or you, you, can't, <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. Uh, there's real, proper, substantial, soulful things that you can do that'll make you feel slowly like a real human being. You you know this through Stephen Jenkinson's work and all the men's stuff. Is the idea is that men men get made kind of one limp at a time, one story at a time. Just because we have beards or even just because we have children doesn't mean we've become true human beings. Mm -hmm. It's a labor. It's a labor. Um, and really, we'll never quite know if we're there or not. It's something that gets fed back to us by other people. On that yes. note, funnily yes. enough, of sort of, you know, waiting. I remember in my 20s, desperately wanting to be recognized or blessed by older men. Um, and that didn't happen because at that at that age I didn't understand the difference between an affirmation and a blessing. Mm. And guys would say, "Oh, you're doing well," and I'd think, "Well, that that hasn't changed anything." But then, when I was about 34, I met someone who just very quietly sort of took me aside and said, "I saw that thing you did. I saw it was beautiful what you did then." And I saw that you, you took a situation that you could have had advantage of and you gave it away for the benefit of someone else and you did it in a way that no one else would notice, but I saw it. Mm. Now that, that's life-changing. You remember, of course, Robert Moore, who I w worked with a, a little bit, just a little bit at the men's conference. And Moore always said, if there's a younger man around you that admires you, and in the last two weeks, you haven't praised them, then you're hurting them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
but the but the on the other hand of course it has to be genuine praise it can't be something that is just given out as i said like an affirmation because often especially when i'm working with with teenagers they already are living in the kind of you know the kind of rather frantic helium affirmation that they're going to they know everything and they're going to save the world and all of that stuff right. and the point of a rite of passage is to take young people and show them they don't know everything by putting them out in the dark in a forest on the top of a mountain and saying big universe big universe say eh? yeah don't now forget. do you want to don't hear forget a story? don't yeah. forget okay. Yeah, I, I, I really love that sentiment. If you haven't been fed, be bread. Um, bread yeah, it's beautiful. And, and the door of mercy is still open. Yeah. I, uh, I wrote this down. I'm going to take this to heart because Good, I'm so I, glad. Think, I think a lot of us need to be reminded of that. Truly, that the door is still open. It's up to us to open it. Yeah. It's up, it's up to us to go out at night and sit under the stars and to become curious once again. That's right. At the, at the end of my 40s, I went on a 101-day vigil. So uh, that wasn't out on a hill without food the whole time, but every day I went to the forest. I did wow. it, and none of my friends knew I was doing it. It was an entirely private endeavor. Uh, and I've done a lot of that. You know, I'm not, you know, I lived in a tent for four years. There's nothing left to prove, yeah. but it just gives you good energy. It's just good for your, it's good for your soulful health to be out there in the energy of the dark and hearing the animals move around and the, and the, you know, the stars overhead, all of it. Yeah. It's yeah. available for the, something I would like to say is that often people think that we're living in a time where the living world has entirely shut down, has incredibly hurt feelings towards us, has nothing left to disclose. It's a nonsense. Believe it or not, even with your mind full of all the distractions that we have now, mm -hmm. if you get yourself out on a wilderness vigil, indigenous culture says that modernity is only three days deep. And on the fourth day, something will crack something will crack usually very subtle you barely know that it's happened but it's happened and you enter what aboriginal teachers call wildland dreaming and it was wildland dreaming i experienced 25 years ago that completely changed the shape of my life i couldn't believe it but the point i'm trying to give encouragement to is don't think that that relationship has been close to you but also right. don't be naive because the challenge for you is not the encounter with, with the beautiful, wild, ebullient, sensual wilderness. It is the return. Mm. The return is going to be hard. The return is going to be hard. And that's why I became a mythologist and storyteller, to find the correct language for the enormity of what had happened. Yes, because the return is integration. The return in coming back with the elixir. Yeah. In that hero's journey, what are you actually returning with? It wasn't just to collect the scars, no. it's to bring back the gold. That's right. If you it's the if you're not careful, if you don't bring something back, you come back not with a holy grail, but with a poison chalice. And I see Ooh. a kind of I see a kind of addiction to disorder in a lot of people. And they say, yeah, man, my life, oh, it's so wild. And I go, no, it's not wild, it's feral. And <laughs> you in a loop where you never get to the third part because you can recognize straight away someone that's integrated this stuff is always that you leave them and you're thinking differently and you feel you've been given a gift and something's happened and there's just more energy and possibility in the room. That's that's the sign, you know, that's the magical imprint of a successful rite of passage because the clue is in the word passage. It is finite. You're not meant to be out on the hill forever. Um, a very senior Lakota Sioux medicine man who I briefly met, Wallace Black Elk, always said, there is such a thing in this world as too much great spirit. In other words, you <laughs> have to have it in a designated container. That's yes. why 
can you believe over here we have little head shops in English towns where school children buy salvia divinorum, wander into a party playing Madonna, thinking it's the same thing as a bit of spliff, right. take it, salvia divinorum times 20, distilled, yeah. the stuff that the shamans don't take. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and of course, they, these poor little kids are brought into it because they say, don't worry, it's only a six minute trip. It's a six minute trip from our perception of what six minutes means. Right. But once, once that, once, once all conceivable reality erupts in front of you, for a 16 year old or a 14 year old, that's going to last a long time. Yeah. Now, I, I'm asked about, you know, medicinal plants and things like that. I have huge respect for the cultures they come from, but they come from, yes. as they have a zip code. Yes. They, they come from a place. That's why going out onto a hill, or more cats are arriving now, uh, more, you know, we go out onto Dartmoor and a few local kids respectfully experiencing mushrooms in a way that people have for thousands of years. That's different in a contained environment. But I just worry we are... There's a kind of tyranny of choice that we're presented with these days. And we simply, you know, we've yeah. just got to be careful what we're gobbling. <laughs> there, there is an enormous amount of leaky spiritual, pseudo-spiritual energy. Um, in the same way that you're talking in the UK, there are people purchasing ayahuasca on who knows where on the dark web. And yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, it's a, it's a dangerous proposition that these medicines can be um, can be put, passed around without the intention, without a circle, without the container. And so we as men, we have to become this container. Like these youth are coming up and they need, uh, not only do they need mentorship um, and an initiation and rites of passage, they need reality, they need guidance. Yeah, they do. They do. And, and they long to be around men that had developed a skill or a craft. It could be a boat maker, could be someone that could make a musical instrument, could be a drummer. It could just be yes. something like we're going to build something today. It's not going to be an entirely interior experience because actually the secret between, you know, underneath vigils and, and many cultures and stories is that most of our soul lives outside of our bodies. Most of us are not meant to be holed up in a cave meditating for 23 hours a day. Some are, but not many. And I think that that's part of just how men function. Uh, I also know something about men especially is we are, we're designed to see things being modeled that then inspire us. Uh, we need to say, say things, Blythe to talk about it, things that are exteriorized. You need to see, you need examples. You just need examples. Now, for example, for example, I was talking to a, a Russian Orthodox priest the other day, uh, and he mentioned a wonderful old phrase to me that, that had an immediate effect on me. The phrase is noblesse oblige. Now, noblesse oblige means you are noble, act noble. You, you know, in, in his, from his perspective, Christ has rescued you from the dung heap, and now you dine with princes, act accordingly. And I knew it, you know, with, with all the wisdom I've managed to sort of ingest or be lucky enough to be around, in that one phrase, I thought, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got to, I've got to go back and do the work again. <laughs> um it's, yeah, so let me ask you here, what is it, what did that mean to you in that moment? What does it mean to be noble? It means in the old Arthurian sense that your words and your actions have to match up. You know, yeah. that's the thing. Uh, in, in many cultures, you get given a name, uh, not, you know, uh, not because of some great spiritual realization you've had in yourself. But the fact that you you uh, you reliably turn up for your children, you know, I I'm never late, I'm just never late, uh, because I knew I wasn't going to kind of open that door in my 
child psyche when our when our family started to shudder yeah. I thought well I'm always going to get to the school dates 15 minutes early she's never going to be waiting for her coyote dad who hasn't turned up that's yeah. just not that's not uh, that's not happening uh, and I've made lots and lots of decisions that meant I didn't in the short term get all sorts of opportunities because I was going to stay at home I don't float from city to city. You may have noticed I'm quite hard to get hold of. And the reason I'm hard to get hold of is because I'm a very invested, mundane, normal, seemingly boring father. And that's <laughs> all the most important stuff for me. In, in that sense of being a normal father is the most noble thing you could, you could become. Mm. To bring it back to that point from earlier. Yeah. Like if yeah. there's anything for us to strive to achieve is to be present, uh, to be loving fathers. At Sacred Sons, we are here for the return of the father archetype. Not the, the God that's far away, not the great father who we have to do good to, uh, to, you know, to be valued, but to bring the father home, to bring the presence to our families, to our communities, because they need us right now, right, right now. Mm. So tell me, Adam, tell me a bit about your work. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you three things that we set off to do at Sacred Sons. Um, the first one is that we were going to show the work. We were going to show the tears of men. Uh, we're not going to tell their stories. We're going to keep it confidential. But we're going to show that men have emotion. We're going to leverage the technology and, and, and show men in their vulnerability and in their rawness. That was one of our intentions in doing this. It's something that's been hidden, even in men's work, even the mythopoetic movement. It's like, this is not to be shamed. This is not to be kept in a dark room. And we're willing to put ourselves out there in this way, in this time. That was the first piece. The second piece is that this work of this masculine alchemy is for all men. We are gonna, this work is gonna be diverse. It's gonna be uh, financially diverse. It's gonna be, uh, culturally diverse. It's not going to rest in the hands of a few uh, white guys, let's say. Uh, so that was another part of the intention. It's going, it's going to be diverse. And, and in that diversity, it's going to be unified. And we believe that, you know, we're inviting in truly all men. And I believe as sacred sons, we've, uh, in terms of the men's work that's been done on this planet, we have been very successful in in unifying men from all cultures, from all backgrounds all around the world. And the third piece of Sacred Sons, it's gonna be cool. It's gonna be fucking cool because you know what? Like doing this work for ourselves is, when we show young men that it's okay to feel, that it's okay to, in, like in what you're saying, to be noble, to do your best. If we make that cool, we can shift culture versus the other stories that I grew up with where womanizing is cool, or where, you know, um, having material possession is cool. Accumulation and taking is cool. What happens when we make service cool, Martin? This is the work that we're doing as Sacred Sons. A lot of the processes, a lot of the, the, the talk when we get in those closed containers, you, I'm sure you'd be familiar with because it's, these are the stories of men that they've carried throughout, throughout history. And so we're, we're reframing it in, in the um, in the time that we come from and in the places that we come from. So we, we are here now and we're sacred sons. Wonderful, wonderful. Long, long, may, long may it prosper. <laughs> <laughs> and we stand on the shoulders of giants uh, like yourself, like Bly, like Robert Moore. And the list goes on. And the list goes on. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for asking. With that, what is it? How does that feel when I say these things? It feels um, it feels exciting. It feels familiar, yeah. in, and and that's familiar in the best sense. In in the sense of the, this is good. It, you remind me of a chef making a really really wonderful meal, and the reputation will get out, and everyone goes to that place because it doesn't serve 20 meals, it serves this one meal incredibly well. And men will always, always long 
deep down, as WB8 says, down in the, the deep parts core uh, for what you're addressing. Uh, so, you know, just just bless you, for, bless you for doing it. You you remind me of me 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> this is a great compliment. Yeah. And my, uh, listen, and, my gray, and, yeah. my gray is getting there. You know, I'm going to get in there. there you've gotta, you, what you have at the moment <laughs> is what they call snow on the mountain. I have blizzard on the mountain, but you've got snow and it's begun <laughs> and you've got all the right conditions in your life of, you know, the pressures of the very normal, wonderful, sacred stuff of raising kids and all the big dreams and all of it. I just think it's very, very exciting. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate the encouragement and the acknowledgement because it means a lot coming from you. And so with that, Dr. Shaw, is there anything that you would like to leave with the brothers and the sisters and the fans of yours who may be listening? No, uh, the, I suppose the only thing I'd like to say is that um, because of COVID, because of lockdown, it's been some years since I've been out on the road. There is a rumor actually that I'll be touring Canada uh, in May, I think, under the auspices of Ian McKenzie and the School of Myth and Poetics. So keep yes. an eye out for me, but uh, just know that, especially if you've met me, I probably remember you. Uh, and I wish you well in your small communities scattered all over the world. Uh, and I look forward to the day somewhere down the road that we were in the re in real time with each other. Beautiful. Until that time, Dr. Martin Shaw, Adam Jackson, Sacred Sons, we're out family. Peace. <laughs>